Looks like it. Oh, wow. Gary's moving to talent. Yeah. Bob's got a Nisi Sunstar arriving tomorrow. Here we are. We're live. All right. We're up and running. Good deal. All right. So as people know, you know, we've got a, a number of of people both on YouTube Live as well as here on Zoom. And, and we keep folks muted just so that we don't have the cacophony of everyone trying to talk at once. Uh, we can unmute for, for questions and things. We're going to be doing some Q&A today. We're going to talk a little bit about contrast and histograms. It's a project Rick and I have been working a ton on on a side project for, uh, for On One Software. A lot of you have probably uh, seen that photo kit that just launched with them, but we've been sort of delving deeply into tone contrast using the histogram both in the field and in editing. So we'll talk a little bit about that, take people's questions on that and photography in general. Um, we got Woody here helping to moderate. We've got Darren looking over YouTube live and sharing uh, stuff from there and keeping us surprised to what's happening there. David Archer's out for today. He's off picking up his brand new, uh, his brand new photo platform he's getting a hobie kayak uh, and rigging his car to tow it so so he can hopefully hopefully he won't lose any more camera gear into the uh the waters of south carolina out of that thing but um <laughs> for those that were here last week <laughs> um but any hooch so, uh what do you have anything to put out before we take off uh just that you know welcome everyone thanks for registering keep an eye on uh, HudsonHenry.com slash office hours for the next time, which we're talking about on April 6th and Hudson and Rick can chat about what that's about. It'll be kind of fun, a little bit different. So uh, I don't know if you want to spill the beans now or later, but uh, that's up to you. Yeah, uh, we might as well, well, might but, well talk about that now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we thought mm -hmm. we'd, since travel's opening back up a little bit, uh, hopefully, and we're very excited about it. We thought that uh, we would ask for people to submit their best travel photos um and photo 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 sorry one photo <laughs> your favorite your favorite travel photo that you've taken it can be from whenever and also instead of a question submit a travel tip that you personally personally use subscribe to and would like to share yeah we're going to be q a yeah we'll still do q a but um hudson's going to be opening up the workshops in the next uh couple of weeks so it's kind of timely for that. We've got our first one scheduled for what the end of August. Yep, thirty first on the Oregon coast. The, yep, thirty first through the third down in uh, down in Charlie Johnson's territory. Um, we're gonna we're gonna go see all those beautiful sea stacks and shoot Milky Way and probably go on a boat trip down to an island lighthouse and have a whole bunch of fun. So cool. out of Brookings, but any hooch. Uh, I think we'll also we're talking about giving away some hats for people that have the our sort of three top travel photos we'll give a little little incentive to get us something something good and uh we'll go through and talk about images and, and talk about all the tips that everybody's given and we'll probably learn as much as we can share so it's always fun stuff and everyone knows right. that he likes his bags and straps and and travel gear so i'm sure there'll be some some bag recommendations and some strap configurations and whatnot yep. Yep. All right. Cool. So I'm going to just jump in. Rick and I have done a, uh, a big photo kit with On One Software that, that's for sale right now on mastering contrast. And it goes through really looking at your histogram on your camera while you're photographing to read whether or not you're capturing all the tonal information that you want and breaking it down into color channels. And then, you know, being able to shoot for the edit while you're out in the field and then looking at that same information in the edit and letting that inform your editing process all the way through to the print. Um, and so we've just, you know, the last, well, I don't know, six weeks or so, Rick and I've been yeah. kind of constantly going over the histogram, writing this ebook, doing this video course, putting together these materials. And so we thought, you know, let's, let's talk about some of the things that we've been exploring. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, and I'm here in Lightroom right now. And I thought, you know, the, the first thing I would, I would go in and talk about is when you have that situation where the tones in your scene are pretty much perfect, you know, this is, 
this is a, a histogram that's, you know, it's not exactly the bell curve. All the three color channels in this are not in a perfect haystack centered around the, the midpoint. But, you know, if, for anybody who isn't familiar with the histogram, the right side of the histogram represents pure white, the brightest color. You know, if you were using the RGB scale in a photo editing application, it's, it's 255, 255, 255, pure white. All three color channels are off the chart. The middle is the midtones, and the left side of your histogram is black. And you know whether we're looking at our camera in the field or our editing software, you can pull up a view where you can see all three color channels, red, green, and blue. The camera captures everything in red, green, and blue and mixes those primary colors to create all the other colors you know, in the tonal spectrum. Uh, and so this image, you know, it's a really nice distribution, raw, straight out of the camera from almost pure black in the blues to almost pure white in the greens. You can see in the scene, as you look at the photo from the back of my camera, this is straight out of uh, one of my Nikons, that the green is the brightest part of our image. And you can kind of get an idea that maybe some of these, these bits of color that are closer to black are in the blue spectrum. If we go through and, um, and take a look at you know how I edit it. All I'm doing is you know I'm getting a little bit of, of close to pure black. I'm darkening up the the black point, spreading that data out a little bit through the histogram in my edit. We get into a scene that's a little more complicated when we get to something that's really high contrast, particularly in a scene where you've got a moving subject and it's going to be tricky to do an HDR type capture. But yeah. you know I think this image. This is one of Rick's. You want to talk about this, Rick? So this was this was down in uh, Boulder City um, a few years back with my wife. We were out on a trip with the trailer, and I we were walking through these set of tunnels that so they have the old rail tunnels, and my wife was just sort of standing looking out at I think the the the, the lake, um, and I just loved the shot, but there was no way to real I couldn't bracket quickly enough. I couldn't do any enough to sort of get everything I wanted in this scene. Um, but I did play around a little bit with exposure and look at the histogram on the back. I, I knew that I wasn't totally blown out in the white channel. There was blown out in the blues and the right. blacks. There was still enough detail in there that I felt that I could get some of that shadow detail back. This was with the uh, Sony RX one. Um, and and, I, and I think one of the keys is looking at the three channel histogram and seeing, yeah. you know, outside on the back of your camera, red was not off the chart. Green was on the edge. Blue was way blown out because of the sky. But you still had some red for detail in there. And then when you go in and look at Rick's final edit, amazingly, you know, our raw cam our cameras with the raw processors have so much dynamic range. It's amazing what you can pull back in post production. Yeah. I think in retrospect, I would have, I probably would have shot this another third of a stop underexposed. Um, mm -hmm. the, the sky is still a little funky to me, um, but it's it 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 pretty much captures what I saw at that time. I mean, the inside of that tunnel was sort of you know had all of that beautiful, you know, reflected light. Yeah, it was just wonderful. So yeah, because the light comes in, bounces off the ground and up. And then, you know, here's, here's a shot. We were teaching a workshop in Death Valley um, and this is out in Mesquite Dunes. And there was this Instagram couple out photographing on the big dune. And it was, you know, one of those evenings where there's not all that much light. It's coming through overcast, but, and this is a good example of a low contrast scene. Rick, you wanna talk yeah. through this one at all? It's the same thing. The, the light was, was so soft. And you know, just like these sort of shafts of light coming through from the from the sunset, and I was just fascinated by this couple. I mean, they were they. they I've got like forty shots from from this whole sequence, but there was nothing I could really do. So I pretty much because it was low contrast, I knew I could get I could get some stuff at both ends of the histogram with my editing. I just wanted to make sure that I've got I had it sharp, and that I had detail. Um, and so then being able to take it into post, you know, I'm, I'm not going to edit it a lot, but I'm going to edit it enough that sort of brings some of that contrast out, you know, gets the, the, the mountains behind her and actually did a little bit of local, local adjustment editing to get those mountains right behind her, the, the dark parts of the mountains, just to sort of get a little bit darker 
so that she popped out of the frame more. Um, right. But as you can see, you know, it's not a it's not a radical edit in any way. It just sort of stretches the tones, and and, and I, go ahead. Oh, I, I was just gonna say, I think it's a mistake that some people make in a low contrast scene. Sometimes trying to stretch the blacks all the way to pure black or the whites all the way to pure white, it, it can actually just make a, a a low contrast scene look unreal. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And there's still some issues I had with it. I mean, you can see the red channel there is, you know, all sitting by itself up there. And that's actually the dunes mostly. Um, right. You know, and so when I went to try and print that, that red sort of came through. And so I had to go in later and just do a little bit of local adjustments on the dunes themselves to kind of reduce some of the, 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 the red in those dunes to get it to print properly. Right. Here's a scene that I photographed uh, right after doing a big panorama of a crescent moonrise about 45 minutes before sunrise. I was sitting up in this this winter scene looking out over Mount Hood, you know, and, and this is before they were making HDR software that I thought did a natural job of blending images. And, you know, I think I shot multiple exposures of this with a thought towards hand exposure blending in the shadows. But this is early on in me using the, the Nikon D800. And I think this is a great example of, you know, I, I'm exposing a bit to the right. I could see, you know, it looked like the red channel was blown out to me on my camera, but green and blue are both solidly there. And anytime you're gonna have the disc of the sun in your frame, you're gonna blow the red channel out. I mean, you're not gonna get the detail of sunspots on the sun. So it's, it's okay to lose one of these three color channels. And you know this was one of the shots that was just amazing to me what I could pull back and post and how much shadow detail was available, just the dynamic range of a new generation of sensors when that Nikon D800 came out kind of blew my mind. And, and, I, and I wanna jump back for a second because of the concept of exposed to the right. I think people hear exposed to the right, exposed to the right, exposed to the right. But I notice more and more that the meter of my camera will often set me more closely kind of pivoted around the, the, the neutral tones, the midpoint, uh, when I have a really low contrast scene. And I might want to boost it just a little bit, you know, to have a tiny bit of detail here in the highlights, which you actually have the kind of toe of this red channel peeking into the highlights. But I find I trust my meter more and more. I would be really worried if this whole pile was over here right up against the edge of black and it really that's underexposed, but the meters are doing an awfully great yeah. job uh, in low contrast scenes, putting that data where it needs to be for you to be able to edit later. I think one thing people often misunderstand is the fact that from a tonal capture perspective, the, the, the blacks in our, in our, the way our sensors capture tones in the sort of computerized age, the digital age, there is exponentially more tonality, more shades of tone in the midtones than in the black, the, the shadows. And there's exponentially more in the highlights than there are in the midtones. So what happens if you really underexpose an image and try to pull it more towards a well-exposed image is you'll sometimes see posterization. You'll see big chunky lines in say the sky at dark parts of your scene where you're trying to spread those shadows into the midtones. There isn't enough tonality there. You know, I mean, I'll simplify it and say there's, there's 10 shades of blue in here and then there's a hundred shades of blue here and then there's a thousand shades of blue to work with here. And that's kind of why the old mantra exposed to the right um, but I think in lower contrast scenes, you're, you're safe if your camera is giving you a histogram that looks something like this. Um, and it's often, you know, it takes a lot of work in a scene like this if you overexpose it to pull it back and look natural. Um, if it looks good on the back of your camera and, and it's a low contrast scene that's, you know, just got a tiny bit of data in the highlights, I think it's fine. You know, this is a good example of that. This uh, I was running and gunning in, in South Carolina with David Archer teaching a workshop uh, down in Charleston. And we went, we were at this wonderful swamp uh, that has spectacular nesting birds. And there was just a, I was shooting a lot of birds in flight and I was in shutter priority mode, I'm pretty sure. 
um, you know, probably a 1500th of a second or something. And, and I was letting auto ISO run and, you know, all of a sudden I turned, I saw this bird, just the contrast, the light playing on this Ibis was so, so uh, not Ibis, this egret was so beautiful um, that, that I just took a quick shot and I wasn't, you know, in a situation where I'm going in and, and checking every detail of my live histogram and looking at my exposure meter, I'm shooting things rapidly and the camera chose to, you know, to, not to expose to the right. It's, it's really preserving highlight details. It's got a lot of data down here in the shadows, but, you know, in going through and editing it, I was able to pull those highlights right up, make this bird stand out, darken the background even more. And I think it's, you know, one thing to think about today, I approach scenes a little bit differently than I did, you know, say I approach a really high contrast scene like this. <clears throat> well, now if I'm, shooting a scene where I know there's a ton of contrast. This was scouting for a workshop in Joshua which we with tree with Rick right before COVID hit. Um, I get into a situation like this. I'm going to set my camera to shoot a shot on the light meter. This is on the light meter. And you take a look at the histogram here in Lightroom. It's a pretty good histogram actually. Um, but I'm also going to take a shot three stops underexposed just to protect the highlights because you know I want to make sure I have that if I need it to composite an HDR, the nice natural way that Lightroom and On One and, um, and Luminar and other, other software products are doing HDR now where it just gives you a linear file with all that tonal information when you combine two images exposed differently. So I'll set my Nikon to capture one frame on the meter and one frame three stops underexposed, put it in burst mode, this is handheld, uh, and just brace myself and, and just pop, pop, just fire it, you know, pushing the button gives me two shots. There's the shot that's preserving all the highlight detail. And then when you blend the two of those, you know, you, you don't really lose anything in the highlights. It's, it's spectacular what we can do. Um, this, this, is, this is an interesting point because years ago, everyone was saying shoot three, shoot five, you know, and, and we've gotten to a point where the, the sensors are so great that you really only need a couple of, of shots. Um, yep. You know, this is one of my big complaints about the Sony after playing around with the, the Nikons is, is the Nikon let me take shoot two shots. You know, Sony, I've got to take three, a minimum of three. Um, you know, but it's like, you don't need that so much anymore. But Hudson and Rick, you guys both prefer to take multiples and bracket that way and composite if necessary, rather than let the camera do it in camera HDR? Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, I, I, in both Sony and I think Canon still, it, in camera HDR builds a JPEG. It doesn't build a yeah. raw file. Yeah. Um, and in, I don't know if Nikon does high contrast does it raw. Thing, you really want raw. Yeah. I mean, you really want raw in a high contrast scene. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you, if you look at that image that I shot, uh, um, in the tunnel, the, the, you know, what, what I really should have done that day had I, had I been more on the ball would have been set the camera up to, to do high speed bracket and, and do that so that I was, you know, then I would have gotten the, the sky much better. Um, hey, Susan, hold still. still. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, it, it's, it, it's, well, I did tell her to hold still. So. <laughs> you know it was a busy day i mean it was like there was no one else in the scene and but there were lots of people coming through the scene so but um no and and this is a decision you can make in the field and you know we've talked about this in the past you know i now have my a7r3 you know one of my custom shooting modes is high speed bracket one stop on the media meter one three under and one three over um, I end up throwing away the, the three over all the time, but it's like it, it now it's just second nature to me. I just dial that to, to number two on my dial and I'm in that mode ready to shoot. You know, yep. this is this is where, you know, we keep talking, know your gear, understand your gear and take advantage of the gear you got so that you can get in these yep. types of situations. Yeah. You know. And, and, and Gary know, asks, you know, when you do the bracket, what about the sun star movement? And you want to you want to talk about that Hudson I mean well you know I think that when you're when you're shooting a sun star as a bracket the, the whole thing whatever you're shooting handheld 
bracketing for HDR, you just want to brace like you were like yeah. you were trying to shoot a much slower uh, shutter speed with a long lens than you should be able to. You know, you do that kind of kind of like a like a like a rifleman, you know, hunting or someone trying to make sure that they're not moving as they take the shot, and you put it in burst mode and and just lay the trigger down. Pa -pa. Yeah, you know, our cameras are so quick now; it just fires two frames like. Pa -pa. You know, just 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 uh, you'll find that the software does a fantastic job. I mean, you look at the neither one of these Sunstars looks like the final one. I mean, it's blending it and making all the choices. The software is awfully yeah. good. Whether you're using <laughs> Adobe or or on one or or you know Luminar, whoever you know, yeah. Skylum, and they're and all, I they're all really good. And I, I think, you know, the point here is that this is literally happening in fractions of a second. Oh, right? yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's, it, if you brace yourself, you know, bring your camera in tight, arms down, you know, and you're mm. just boom, boom with that high speed continuous shooting. It, it, and the software that we've got now in terms of being able to align things, it's, it's it, 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 it really is pretty amazing. Yeah, it is. And I would always suggest, you know, for people photographing a sun star, you know, the, the only potential, uh, <laughs> the only potential uh, uh, diversion from this argument I'll make might be if you're at, if you're at, uh, if you're at, at Mesa Arch at dawn with a hundred people, you should try to be on the tripod and wait for that moment that the star drops through the top of the arch. But the second that that's over, I would come off the tripod and I would be in aperture priority mode, you know, picking the aperture that gives you the sun star that's your favorite and moving around with that wide angle lens, looking through, if you're a mirrorless shooter, looking with one eye closed so you're not burning it on the sun, looking at the little projection of what that sun star looks like with your depth of field preview button held and just fire the frames, you, you know, handheld with yeah. a wide angle shooting sun stars, you can, you can make it what you want just by, just by little tiny itty bitty motions. Um, I think a handheld is your way to go. Um, and, and if you're shooting with a DSLR, well then put it in live view, block the viewfinder and, and, you know, try not to look past the camera at the sun, keep, keep it shadowing your eyes and watch what's happening in the live view. Um, yeah. I do want to make the point that, you know, in high contrast scenes where there's no possible way to even consider bracketing and doing HDR, our cameras are amazing. I was shooting this kiteboarder in Aruba and I literally, I had been out kiteboarding and I just brought my D850 with a 51.8 prime lens just in case something neat was happening. And this guy was such a great kiteboarder. He stayed out as the sun was setting and I was photographing him, you know, at, at different points as he went by in burst mode and he went right behind the sun on me. And, you know, looking at this image on the back of your camera, you think, ah, but you look at, you know, looking at the histogram, well, it looks like it's a little blown out, but bringing it into post, I was able to do some work and look at how much shadow detail our cameras can hold on to i've blown the details here in the circle of the sun who cares you know it, the way that it lines up in the clouds it looks like a bit of the sun peeking through and i have a trick for for tweaking these pure white bits so that ink will lay down on paper there just by adjusting the curve a little bit um, so that there isn't any pure white in the image you just adjust it so that the highest tonality in your whole image is a very 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 bright gray um, and, and there's a couple of tricks for that, but, uh, I mean, I, this is just mind bending. This would not have been possible with sensors 10 years ago. It would never even, you wouldn't imagine this in film, but yeah. you know, it, it, it's amazing. Same thing goes out in the landscape. Now this is before I was really doing HDR. This was my first trip to Patagonia and finding these magnificent falls with my great friend, John Eastcott, who's one of the only other people I know that knows of them. Um, and we got up there. It, it took him a little while to find it. It's off trail. And, and we got there a little later than we wanted in this tree that you see the little bit of was casting a shadow across the fall. But, you know, exposed to the right a bit, make sure that you're not blowing the details in the glacier and the sky up there. And then, you know, some local adjustment work and careful uh, editing 
the shadows are, are so recoverable today in digital. It's kind of the yeah. opposite of film. In the film days, you shot for the shadows and the highlights were really nicely protected. Today, you shoot to protect the highlights and the shadows are easily pulled out. Um, sure. Likewise, you know, this is, this is, this is a scene that I, I saw up on Mount Rainier. Here's what it looked like on the back of my camera, straight out of the camera. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's a beautiful scene, but it looks a little bit flat with the, the, the smoke. It's forest fire smoke really playing through uh, the foothills in late summer. This is August coming down from the summit of Mount Rainier. And then you go into post-production and look at what you can do with an eye to the histogram and just increasing contrast and then warming the image a little bit. I actually think that the camera was a little bit too neutral. It was, it was warmer light than that. Um, so, uh, you know, I guess, go ahead, Rick. I think one of the things that um, we've been trying to talk to people about just sort of in general in the field and in workshops and is, you know, we're trained to look at the, image we shot on the back of our camera, we look at that image. A lot of times what we don't do is look at the histogram, which is what will help us understand what we can do in post, right? Yeah. Um, and, and that histogram that you see on the back of your camera is going to be pretty much identical to the one that you see when you bring your image back in to Lightroom or on one or whatever you use to edit your images. You know, it really is kind of the key to this photograph, you know, right. I knew what I could do with that image in post to make it pop, even though the scene itself was not popping, you know, right. um, it's, it's understanding how to read that histogram and, and what, what you have available for data in the image that you just shot, you know, you know, I, I look at this one out in the field and I see, oh, there's no highlights that are out beyond pure white. I've got all the tonal information in this image. There's no spike in the shadows. There's no spike in the highlights. And there aren't very many shadows and blacks. I can easily move this data to create more contrast in my final scene. You can see I'm just sort of pushing more things into the shadows to get that dark late evening feel. Um, yeah, we've, it's we've talked, yeah. Hey, do you ever use zebras? I only use zebras when I'm filming. I don't, I don't find it all no. that useful. Um, I, I find it distracting. I'm not a giant fan of um, really intense focus peaking where there's little blinking, you know, lines around all my contrast edges in my scene as I'm composing. And I, the, the zebras are wonderful when you're filming because when you're filming, you don't have, you can't have as many overlays and information on your screen. Um, it really gets in the way of composing and seeing your scene as you're filming. So zebras are wonderful to see if you're starting to blow the highlights. I, I much prefer having a live histogram running, taking a look at it or watching my exposure meter. And then with stills, you can shoot and look at what the image looks like and what the histogram on the back of the camera looks like. I mean, that, that's really your key. You know, th this is another example. This is during the fires in Portland. Um, and I think I had my white balance a little off. It was a lot warmer that day, but you know, this is part of a panorama that I shot and it's, it's literally, um, you know, sweeping through the scene, looking for what part of the image is brightest, what part of the image is dimmest. This is a pretty low contrast scene. I really set my exposure for kind of the brightest part of this, this, this panorama. And I'm not gonna adjust exposure at all as I go through and shoot. Everything's in manual. ISO is locked down in manual. And then, you know, going in and, and assembling the whole thing and editing it, I'm boosting the contrast, warming the scene a little bit. I think, you know, the, the, the key is look at your exposure meter, look at your live histogram, whatever, you know, the mode in your camera you're in that you're the most comfortable with, shoot and then look at that histogram on the back of your camera. What is it telling you? Oh, perfect scene. I don't have to worry about a thing. Oh, we're in high contrast territory. Should I bracket? Should I be exposed to the right? Should I make sure that at least one of the color channels is still there for me to get detail back out of? Um, right. and I, think, I don't think we have any, I don't think we have any images any examples to show today, but the the back of almost every mirrorless camera and, and DSLR right now will show you a three channel red, green, and blue histogram view in playback mode. 
and learning how to yep. get to that screen so that you can look at it. And, you know, one of the magic things about the histogram is, you know, you can have two of those three channels blown out. And as long as you still have some data in that third channel, you've got a good chance of being able to get some data back when you, when you get in and, and play with your highlights. Absolutely. I saw that um, the question about when you're bracketing with sun stars, will the direction of the sun stars rays change? That's a good question. They won't if you're, um, they won't if you're not changing aperture. So your camera is almost all invariably, if you're in aperture priority mode, it's going to bracket around shutter speed. And I would argue if you're shooting sun stars, you should be in aperture yeah. priority mode picking what aperture you want. So it's only going to change the shutter speed. The aperture or the, the aperture changes are what change the angle of the sun star, not shutter speed. So it won't change. And then um, Bill, just again, talking about those high contrast situations where you, you bracket, um, mm -hmm. having the sun blow out is an acceptable Thing to do oh, yeah. in those types of situations you know because you'll I mean, use that lower that that three stop thunder exposed will actually not necessarily be blown out although having a little bit at the center of the sun blown out is not the end of the world it's more oh, i and i i think invariably there's going to be a lot so you're not going to get all the detail in the center of the sun yeah. just like if you're photographing a night cityscape you're going to see that every little street light you know, if you, if you stop down, it's going to be a sun star. If you don't stop down, it's going to be a bright point of light. And, and those are specular highlights. The center of the sun and a sun star is a specular highlight. It's not someplace that the eye is going to expect there to be any detail. Um, you know, think of chrome glinting on a car in the sun in a scene where the whole scene's really well exposed, but that chrome bumper has a little star and a, a gleaming point. And if you look at the back of your camera, you might even see a little spike, you know, in one or two, or maybe even all three of the channels if you're doing a night scene. A night scene, you, there may be no real way to get a good exposure where you don't see a little spike on the right side in white in all three color channels. And those are just specular highlights. If it's tiny and you've got little stars from the city lights, that's really okay. You're gonna edit the image for the whole rest of the image. And then there's, there's a little trick. We actually give a preset for on one and, and I can create one for Lightroom too. We'll probably eventually launch the equivalent of this photo kit for Lightroom just privately. Um, but there's a, there's a preset that you can hit that just adjusts the curve layer. Um, if you wanted to see it really quick, let me show you. I mean, essentially what you do for a specular highlight if you wanna go and print later is, um, hold on, I'll go into my, my image that has a sun star in it. You would go in to develop and you would open up the tone curve and you can just essentially move that tone curve down just a touch at the output for all three color channels. So it moves it from say, 255 to 250. I put it at 257, but you can put the output to 250. And now all of a sudden there's no pure white in your image. If that's the last move that you make in your editing flow, whether you're, if you're in Photoshop, you adjust a curve in Photoshop as the top layer. If you're in on one, throw in an effect as the last thing that you do that's a curve and drop it from 255 to 250 as the output. It's saying no tone in this image can be 255, 255, 255 for red, green, and blue numbers, which would equal white. So instead you're saying and, it's a very bright, bright gray. Right. And, and what that does for you in printing is makes the printer lay a little bit of light gray ink down in that spot. So you don't have a spot that just looks like paper texture. It looks like ink laid down over that spot. Um, it's just a specular. Yeah, called the loss differential. So. Mm -hmm. um, it looks terrible. If you have a print yeah. where there's pure white and no ink gets laid on the paper and the sunlight hits it and you see, ooh, you know, there's the spot with no ink. Yeah. Although to be fair, the, a lot of the, the newer printers have gloss optimization technology built into them. Um, the new Epson's actually use the gray ink to, to put oh, down yeah. a little bit wherever that, that is. So, but. You're getting um, smarter. Yep. Carl asks, uh, given a choice and if possible, is it best to preserve one color channel over another when you get in those situations where you've got one or two channels blown out? 
I don't I don't think nature generally gives you a choice unless you're really yeah. controlling the lighting with artificial lighting. You're, you're yeah. going to find that, you know, in a blue hour scene, it's the blue that blows out. In a, in a sunset scene with the sun in it, it's going to be red that wants to blow out. Um, yeah. In the scene with the duckling on the water glinting with the reflection of the trees, if you push it too far, it's going to be green that blows out. It just totally depends on what the bright color in your scene is. You just want to make yeah. sure that if you have no choice but to blow a color channel, you want to try to preserve the other two. Um, when Charlie asks, when bracketing, do you meter on the brightest area versus metering you know, on the darkest and stopping down or metering on the darkest and opening up? I mean, and I'm finding that the modern cameras are so good and I've shot enough with Sony and Fuji and Nikon to say this, uh, with all three of them that I generally just use their most advanced metering mode and I almost never deviate from it. You know, the, the rare time I would deviate from, from matrix metering in Nikon or evaluative metering in Canon or Sony uh, would be if, you know, I'm shooting uh, my cat in a ray of sun in a scene where I want a big negative space around it all to be pure black. And the camera would try to balance that whole scene yeah. You know, and I would stick a spot meter on the cat's face that's in that shaft of pure sunlight that's way, way, you know, that occasionally I'll use a spot meter in a situation like that. You know, you think of the great black and white photographs of like a ray of light coming through a dark, pure black space and lighting one small element in the scene. And that's the only thing that's well exposed. Those kinds of scenes are made for spot metering. But in general, I trust the evaluative uh, matrix style metering in the modern cameras. And I just, shoot one on the meter and one three stops underexposed and then look at the histogram. You know, if there's a problem, then I'm going to see that that three stop underexposed image is, is still blowing all three color channels. Well, then I have to kind of rethink things. Do I need to add in a little exposure compensation? Do I need to shoot three frames? Um, you know, it's pretty rare. I mean, uh, in today's cameras with as much dynamic range as they have and as good as their meters are, I, I, it's, it's rare the number of times per year I take my camera out of its matrix mode. Um, you know, the, 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 the exceptions to trusting that meter or maybe shooting birds in flight on a bright overcast day, I might add in some exposure compensation and be constantly looking at images and their histogram on the back to see, am I really underexposing these birds? Do I need to, to you know, am I in the right spot? You know, there, there's certain situations. I think the key that we keep saying over and over is push play and check the histogram, <laughs> push play, look at the image, check the histogram. So um, I'm going to tee this one up or, or Tony has teed this one up for you. Um, okay. Tony said he went out to practice bracketing and took a bunch of single shots of the same subject. He said with numerous shots, how do I identify which ones are the ones that can be edited as brackets to, to merge? No, that, that is, a, that is teed up. Um, so if I'm shooting, uh, uh, if I'm shooting a panorama or a hist, oops. Oh, I bumped. There we go. Okay. Sorry. I bumped my, my input there. If I'm shooting a panorama or an HDR or anything like that, before I take the first shot, that's going to be blended into everything. I take a dark slide, just shoot my hand or put the, put the lens cap in front of the camera and shoot a black image or if I see my hand, you know, some blurry aberration in my hand, then, you know, if I shoot a panorama, I'll shoot every frame, then shoot my hand. If I'm shooting an HDR, shoot my hand, shoot the HDR, shoot my hand. Focus stacking, even more important, if you're shooting focus stacking, then every image looks identical in the grid in, in Lightroom or on one. I mean, you go to look at them, the exposure's not changing, the camera's not moving. How do you know which one's the first one? You really, you get it all set, you get your exposure dialed, you get your focus, you shoot, you check the histogram, then you put your hand in front of the camera, run the focus stack, put your hand in front of the camera, shoot one more. And you know that in between those two dark slides in your grid, everything in between is one thing, right? I do that for time-lapse, I do it for HDR, I do it for panoramas, I do it for focus stacking. Yeah, thanks, Tony. <laughs> um, so, with respect to contrast and noise, what do you how, how do you work to minimize noise when increasing contrast? Uh, well, I mean, 
working to keep your ISO as low as you can in the field is the best first choice for not having bad noise in your images. Working to not expose everything in your image in the shadows and have to brighten those shadows is another way. That's another one of the great benefits of making sure that your data is at least on the other side of the midpoint of your histogram, looking at your histogram. If all your data is bunched up in the shadows, you're underexposed. And if you try to pull that data out of the shadows, we talked about po posterization a little bit earlier, but you're also gonna increase noise as you brighten shadows. So, I mean, the key out in the field to noise reduction is keeping as low an ISO as you can. And the key, the second key is making sure you're not underexposing your images. And then in post-production, it's, you know, it's, there's, there's, good techniques for doing noise reduction, whatever software you're using, it just takes practice. It's a it, Noise reduction is one side of the coin, sharpening is the other, because the way that we do noise reduction is we blur fine details in the image. So you need to blur the right sized fine details to take out the noise and then sharpen the right sized details to bring back the contrast edges that matter to you to look sharp and find that balance between the two. And every image is different, so. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a delicate dance, but you can do a lot in the field to make your job easier by just kind of keeping your right. eye on not letting that ISO run too high if you don't need to. I see a lot of images from people, the beautiful landscape scene, and it's at F22 uh, ISO 3200. And you're like, no, no, you know, you probably didn't need F22 for this scene. First of all, you're introducing diffraction. Secondly, you're slowing your shutter speed down to the point where the camera is choosing at 3200 ISO and inducing noise. You know, you have to kind of think about those, 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 those variables as you're working and know that ISO equals noise. I remember one day in Death Valley, I had one of the most beautiful dawns. The wind had blown 50, 60 miles an hour at night. I was the first one out at dawn and the dunes, not a footprint. And I had been shooting the Milky Way the night before. This was years and years and years ago. And I forgot to change my settings. And I shot that whole thing at 3200 ISO with a D200. And if anybody knows how the D200 was at 3200 ISO, it was terrible. <laughs> it's like a set of beautiful and unused, unprintable images. Um, so it, it, there seems like there's still a little bit of confusion about, about metering and bracketing. When you, you're building a panorama, um, do you meter on the brightest area or do you meter on the darkest and, and, and how do you make those choices? Like that, that panorama that you showed at the, the, the bridge last summer, you know, you were very clear about which one was going to be your metered shot, the shot that set your meter for that, correct? Right, I, I, so I, if I'm gonna photograph a panorama, um, let's, let's say I'm photographing it handheld, I'll, I'll kind of look at it and sweep the scene with, in manual mode and I'll watch the light meter in my camera. And where I get to the point where the light meter is kind of hitting the brightest point, you know, I'll, I'll adjust my manual settings. Knowing my camera, I often, if it, there's a lot of contrast in my scene, I'll set it so that it shows two thirds of a stop overexposed, shoot it, take a look at the histogram. That particular frame that has the brightest part of my scene in it. Make sure that it looks like an acceptable histogram to me, knowing my camera, having used it as much as I have, and then I'll, I'll shoot the whole scene at that setting and then run through and look at each image and look at the histograms for them too. You know, shoot it and look at it in three color histogram. Um, and you know, I've done it enough that I, I know with this camera, if, there's, if, there's, if it's showing you know, a lot of contrast, a, a third of a stop or two thirds of a stop overexposed and the brightest part of my frame is probably gonna be just fine. Um, if there's a scene where, you know, say you're shooting a, a nightscape, um, finding the spot in the frame that has the most bright highlights and dark shadows at the same time, exposing for that, shooting it, testing it. I, I pick that spot in my frame where, you know, watching the meter as I sweep through, I see that's the, that's the spot with the best highlight representation. And then I just check it and meter it. You know, occasionally I'm gonna shoot an HDR pano. If everything's not moving, the light's not changing really rapidly, 
it's fine to shoot bursts, you know, mm -hmm. shoot the, the shot on the meter, the shot three stops under exposed for every single frame of it. And now the software even does automated HDR panorama blends. It used to be you had to blend every single set of HDR with the same exact settings and then blend all the results as a pano. Now the software does that for you. Yeah. Um, Charlie, that helpful? Okay. Cool. <laughs> um, so Al Wilson asks about, you know, is, is using a color checker going to help you get a better histogram? No, not to me. The color checker is going to help me uh, get a great white balance in a complicated light scene, you know, particularly when you're dealing with artificial light and natural light and, you know, what's, what's around your subject. The most important part of your scene, if you put the color checker out, then you can just click it with the white balance dropper later on. Or you can, you can white balance your camera, you know, preset to that color checker just by kind of filling the frame with it in the light that you're in and, and, and telling the camera to set white balance for that. Of course, all that stuff's so editable after the fact. If you just throw a color checker out in your scene, it does a nice job creating a target for you to click with your white balance eyedropper and get a perfect white balance because it's got that neutral gray card in it. It, it isn't so much going to help me get my... Uh, get my, my exposure and my histogram perfect. No. Okay. I don't see any other contrast related questions. Let me just, I'll just check one. Got a, got a uh, Sony question for, for the resident Sony expert over on from YouTube. <laughs> um, <laughs> So is there a way to get rid of the ribbon at the bottom of the screen that shows aperture, the shutter speed, because it kind of gets in the way of the histogram is kind of the question. Oh, you're talking about the live histogram. Yeah. No, I don't believe, no, there is not a way to do that. Um, yeah, no. Or in Nikon. Yeah, I don't, I, and, and to be honest, I don't use the live histogram overlay all that much when I'm working in the field. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, I might use it when I start out just to sort of, especially if I'm not quite sure what I'm looking at and just want to make sure, but I've gotten so used to taking a shot on what I believe is the, the, the scene and the metering that I want, and then immediately looking at the histogram on the back. You know, I mean, it, it's, I, I am so good with that display button, you know, flipping between the the full screen view with no overlay at all and the histogram. I mean, if I could, I would just have those two screens and nothing else. So that's one thing you can do in Nikon. You can't turn off and on. Yeah, you can turn off and on which displays you want in the animation. Uh, yeah. Well, that's all right. <laughs> My camera's still better than yours. <laughs> <laughs> um, what? They're all be, great. Have you played with uh, NX Studio yet? I know we talked about that two weeks ago. The the not enough to pass judgment. I found some things rather frustrating off the bat, but you know, but it, it's better than the last thing that I saw from them. So, yeah. Have you? Yeah, I, I haven't. Yeah. Um. Dave DeMarco asks if you use highlight metering mode and whether you think it's a good idea or you simply do expose to the right. You know, I, again, I like I said, I'm maybe and maybe this is a maybe this is an old dog new trick thing. Um, I could see a situation where you might be really worried about protecting highlights, and this is a metering mode where the camera basically works to expose to the right without quite blowing the scene out. That's its, that's its primary objective. Um, and most of the camera brands have incorporated it. I still run with matrix metering. Uh, it just works so well for me. I haven't seen a need. Again, checking my images and making sure that the histograms look like I want. You know, I don't always want it exposed to the right. It's, it's, I, I find the matrix metering in Nikon works just fabulously. I'll probably play with it and test it a little bit. The, the truth is I haven't used it very much, no. Yeah. Yeah, and I haven't used it on the Sony either. I mean, some of it is you just, I, I think for us, we get so comfortable with this, looking at the histogram, knowing what that image will look like when we get back to our computers that 
you know, it doesn't mean that it's not valuable. Um, no. Um, Rob asks, you know, he said he's seen people use the multiple exposure method to block out the sun with their thumb. Yeah, um, I've heard of that. I haven't ever done it, but uh, I think what we're talking about here is for a lens that has real problems with ghosting. Um, and actually, it might be something to try with, with that Nisi Sunstar lens that I've been using lately, um, just because it's so wide. If you were on a tripod and you were setting up a scene with the sun right in it, and it throws such a spectacular sun star without even obscuring any of the sun at all of its apertures. And it's so wide, it does have a little bit of ghosting if you set the sun off of center. And I could see, you know, you, you take a shot all manually exposed, and then you take one where you just block the sun from, from hitting the center of the frame, but you're still not obscuring the area where the ghost was in the frame and then just blend the two in post. I could see that being valuable. Just, it's probably only gonna work with a really wide angle lens on the tripod though. Um, Rob asks about Sony, is there a way to get the histogram to display as a single graph rather than displaying each channel on its own histogram? It's in the, in the playback mode, you actually get four histograms. You get the red, green, and blue, and then you get the, the the it's composite channel. channel at the top. Um, mm -hmm. When you're in live view, the only one that it displays is actually the single graph. Um, there's yeah. no way to sort of customize that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and, and I'm when I'm looking at that view, I am looking at the histogram. I don't care about the image, to be honest. If I want to then see, do I check, does the focus look right? That's when I'll flip the display mode into sort of the full screen view and then zoom in and check focus. Um, right. You know, it's kind of a two step process. So, um, yep. okay. So I'm just running through some of the questions we got left. Uh, Steve Thompson asked, and it was kind of interesting. Um, how do we tell if our old lenses will be capable of resolving all the detail with these new high resolution sensors? Um, you know, and it's, it, it it's an interesting question because we're seeing all of these great and expensive lenses that have been designed for these mirrorless cameras and the sensors that they're, they're working on. But there are also some wonderful old lenses. I mean, I'm still using my Sony or my Canon 16 to 35 2.8 L lens from 2001 on my Sony, and I love it. I, you know, my favorite lens for years and years and years, and one that just never left my bag was Nikon's 14 to 24 28. And it was a revolutionary lens. There, there were, you know, people that were shooting other brands for different reasons were jealous of that lens. It was amazing. <clears throat> and I, you know, in the days when I fell in love with it, the biggest camera I had was 12 megapixels. And, you know, then you move to 36 megapixels. And I started noticing, you know, if I was making giant prints, the center was a lot better than the edges, you know, and I didn't notice that at 12 megapixels. And now that I have the new 14 to 24 millimeter lens where it's insane corner to corner at 46 megapixels, you notice they did something that made these, you know, partly the shorter flange distance, partly the wider lens mount and just new optical designs, they're designing stuff for much higher resolution and probably forward designing it for more resolution than we have now. That doesn't mean that that old 14 to 24 is a bad lens. You know, I have prints that are 24 by 36 that look beautiful shot with that lens. I, you know, I had magazine covers with that lens. Um, it, it, and, and not everybody's printing things big enough to notice. You know, we're talking about taking a 46 megapixel image and zooming to 100% in the corner. You know, I mean, if you put your it up on the biggest of TV screens or print it in a, in a normal, you know, even 17 by 22, 24 by 36, carefully, it's going to look beautiful. You know, if you walk right up and put your eye to the edge of a big print, you're going to say, oh, it, there's a little distortion and softness in the edges, sure. Um, there are some wonderful old lenses that have beautiful optical qualities and there's no reason to toss them, but the new lenses are a revolution and mirrorless is making the design of them easier for the engineers and the edge to edge sharpness. I just read a, 
a, a, an interview with a, uh, a really famous Getty photographer who's photographed everything from the Olympics to White Houses. And he's switched over to the mirrorless system. And they were saying, what's your favorite thing about it? And he said, I can crop in the cor I can crop to a corner now. You know, I always had to make sure if I needed to crop something and I was shooting something that I kept what was important in the center. And now, you know, I can get my images back and I can crop right into the corner with any of these new lenses. They're just sharp edge to edge and it's a revolution. Um, so I do think that there is something to be said. All the camera brands are building better lenses now than they were five years ago. Um, they're just amazing. So. Yeah. Um... We have uh, someone who asked just about cleaning sensors. Ah, well, I'll give a shameless pitch of self-promotion. We'll ask the question too, but. Uh, so how can I clean I my, my Sony sensor and, the, and the front glass of my lens? Right, I think if you jump into, into my store, there's a course in here that we just actually put in that's completely updated for mirrorless and DSLR. Uh, I kind of redid my, my equipment cleaning and maintenance course. It's not very expensive. It's just a few videos. But I think that in, if you're shooting just about any of the latest gear, um, if you turn off the camera, it's going to lock out the in-body image stabilization and lock that sensor in rigidly. And, and using a wet cleaning kit is not that... Uh, not as scary as it sounds. You know, it's literally a five-minute job that people charge you forty dollars to do, uh, and and I, the more you do it, the simpler it gets. I, I've been to camera shows where the Nikon techs and the Sony techs and the Canon techs are literally like leaning down and reefing on the sensor swabs to get a stubborn spot out. I mean, the the things are pretty darn durable if you're using the right tool, the right. Uh, stuff. I've got links for all the stuff that I use to clean my sensors and I do it all the time. I think one of the biggest keys is keep your camera upside down when you're switching lenses. Don't turn it, yep. you know, take the lens off and leave it for every bit of dust in the world to float down in or, or you know, anything to get on the sensor. Keep it upside down when you're changing lenses to stop stuff from getting in there. Keep a blower brush like Rick just held up in his hand, uh, a rocket blower around and blow that mirror box out yep. every day. You know, don't let get stuff, stuff get encrusted on there. And you'll find you don't need to wet clean it very often. But the, you know, yeah. the little gel sticks work great. The, the wet swabs are the best. Um, and it's not as hard as you think. It really I isn't will, as hard as you think. I will say that, that when we do a workshop, every night when we get back from the field, we clean our gear. We oh, yeah. blow out the, the box. You know, if we think there's there's something in there, I mean, we've been in situations. I know I've cleaned, you know, pulled out a, a sensor swab and cleaned my my sensor on a, on a night when we're shooting out at the coast. Um, oh yeah. You know, it's just kind of like that. End of the day, make sure that you got everything, and make sure that everything's clean. Make sure your lenses, lens, front lens elements, are clean. Um, you know, we use those Zeiss swabs that that are just wonderful. Um, I and I clean a lot of I clean a lot of workshop participants cameras and show them how to do it when we're out on workshops but you know yeah. one of the one of the things I would hazard I, I would just give a little disclaimer if you're shooting with some of the really schnazzy like Olympus has that sensor on a moving carriage that does kind of yeah. internal panorama type stuff and they, they actually have a note that only a an Olympus certified technician is supposed to clean that sensor. I don't think it locks out. Its carriage is a little bit delicate. So, you know, if you have a camera brand that's not, you know, Canon, Sony, Fuji, Nikon, double check, you know, do a little Google yeah. search of whether it's okay. I When I first got my first mirrorless camera, the first thing I thought was, you know, the thing has in-body image stabilization. Is it safe for me to clean it? And I immediately read that the minute that you turn off the camera, the sensor is locked and that whole system's locked out and it is safe. Um, so it's actually easier to clean a mirrorless camera than a DSLR because you don't have to reach down as far inside it and peer yeah. as deep into it to see if it's done well. So Yeah. There's a comment on YouTube that some of these cleaning supplies have been out of stock or the links aren't working. Um, mm. there's a whole bunch of supply issues going on right now. Um, Everywhere. you want to buy, a, you want to buy one of these new printers, 
or ink cartridges, they're actually in short supply. Um, yeah. You a know, bunch are at the bottom so. of the ocean, aren't they? And yes, and a bunch of them are. I, I don't know. The there was a. I, I read a story the other day that the number of containers that have fallen off ships in the last six months is greater than the average of the last ten years on a yearly basis. So wow, there's a whole bunch of stuff at the bottom of the ocean right now. Um, wow. So I, we're just about out of time. Uh, Bob Woodrow had a question if you had any soft issues with soft focus on the 500 PF. No, uh -uh. I, sure, I, I, I find that lens just really razor sharp. I, I think if you try to put a bigger teleconverter than 1.4 on it, it, it isn't made to handle more than 1.4, but even with the 1.4 on it, it's really, really sharp. Um, yeah. I, I, yeah, I've that my 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 favorite thing about that is how sharp it is, even wide open. If there's a problem with soft focus with it, you might want to shoot it into Nikon to have a look at it. Okay. Well, you know, one thing I one thing I'll say really quick, just to test that, take that lens out someplace in your town where there's you know a brick wall, and set up. The, we had a question about sort of checking sharpness. And, and I can't remember. Well, I think it was in part of, part of with that, the question about the, you know, old lenses, new gear, what do you do? Yeah, um, right. So, so I think this is actually a really good tip. If you are curious about how sharp is my lens or is my lens got a focus issue or is it an optical issue? You know, go, go out someplace where you have a big brick wall. Um, it needs to be bigger if it's a wide angle lens. It can be smaller if it's a 500 and set up and, you know, autofocus on that wall, you know, set up to where you're perfectly perpendicular to it. You're not shooting it at some angle where it falls away. Get square up on it, teed into it perpendicular. Get your camera on a tripod, perfectly, on a tripod get your camera perfectly level, shoot it autofocused, then defocus it, zoom into 100% and manually focus it to where you have perfect, as perfect a detail as you can in those bricks, shoot that, compare the two. Is there an autofocus problem with this lens and camera? Um, you shouldn't with mirrorless lenses have very much because they're, mir they're, they're focusing off the image that the sensor sees. Um, but with a DSLR, sometimes you just need to calibrate it. You, know, you can use software like Rykan's Focal, I talk a lot about if you search that in my YouTube channel, you'll find a whole video about it. But um, the the thing about old lens, new lens, set up in front of that brick wall where it's all the same distance from you and manually focus the center of it perfectly. And then without changing the focus at all, shoot every aperture of the lens and then bring those in and zoom in and look at the corners compared to the center and see how your old lenses are and your newer lenses are and where the sharpest point in your lenses are, you'll see changes and differences. I just did a thing about the Nisi 15 millimeter Sunstar that was sort of astounding with how good it was. But I think if you watch that video I did last week, you'll see there's, there's a bit of a change from F4 to F8 in the corners of the image. It's sharper in the corners. It's sharp everywhere in the center, but you know that's a really great way to test. Set up someplace where you're shooting something that's all the same distance from you with a pattern and detail to it. Brick walls are great. Brick walls are your friend for testing your lens out. It's a boring right. shot, but it tells you a lot. You know, yeah. people try to ask me if there's a problem with their lens and they'll show me an image where it's grassland spreading out to trees in the mid ground with mountains in the distance. And I'm like, I don't know where you're focused. I don't, you know, I mean, the brick wall is the test site. Yeah. All right. Well, I think uh, that's uh, going to do it for another Office Hours Tuesday. All right, everybody. So next week, submit your favorite travel photo and tips. We're going to talk about two weeks. getting out there. Two weeks, sorry. Two weeks. Uh, <laughs> April 6th. April 6th, yeah. guys. All right, everybody. Okay. Thanks, for, thanks for being part. We'll see you all in a couple weeks. Bye, everybody.